Today we have the honor to speak uh, with uh, Thomas Björkman, uh, investment banker, the Club of Rome member, social entrepreneur, also investor in Rebel Wisdom, and author of various books, including The Nord Nordic Secret. Thomas, welcome and thank you so much for your time. Thank you very, very much. I'm very glad that to be on your program. Thank you. So you mentioned that I'm, I'm an author of uh, The Nordic Secret, and I should mention the main author of the book, my colleague and friend, Lena Anderson, of course. So I'm the co-author of, of that work. Absolutely the main fantastic of, work. <laughs> the world as we create. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Would you be so kind and give us a brief background about you and your career? What was the genesis of your way of thinking from being an investment banker to a philosopher and social entrepreneur? Uh, has this been a straight path? No, it has not been a straight path. I, I actually come from a very uh, humble background in rural Sweden. I was the first person in my family, both on my father's and mother's side, that had the opportunity to go to university. And I actually started a career in a university career in mathematics and, and physics, but decided for various reasons to go into business. And in business, I've started around 20 different companies, some small and unsuccessful, but at least three major ventures in IT, uh, property, and as you mentioned, in investment banking. I, I built a banking group in Scandinavia and sold that to uh, the fourth largest Swiss banking group, the EFG Group, in 2001, and had to commit to remain as chairman of the the board of the bank group in Sweden and be on the board of the Swiss bank for five years. But when that contract ended in 2006, I was very happy to leave both the banking world, but also the business world to set up my own foundation to look into the relationship between our personal inner growth and development and societal change. And that idea I actually got from my years in business, where I was, work, was fortunate enough to work together with very talented business development and leader de development consultants who showed me the importance of this lifelong inner growth in cultivating managers to be able to deal with an in increasingly complex world. The world seems to get crazier by the day. <laughs> and we seem Absolutely. to get... Absolutely. And we are, speaking, we are speaking just a few days after the storming of the capital in, in, in the US. Absolutely. So that's absolutely true. Yeah. And we seem to get even more dis disorientated in it. Here is ever more frequent questions circulating. WTF is going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And why are we reacting to it like, like we are? Yeah. So, so I think um, that we are uh, actually right uh, in the beginning of a very fundamental societal shift uh, again. Uh, as humanity, we've gone through these uh, societal shifts every now and then, and some of them are, have been deeper than others. I think the shift that we are going through right now uh, is going to be a very deep shift, and it's going to be at least on the level of the uh, enlightenment and the industrial revolution when can we, you help the us uh, world... a bit a bit with some historical percep perce uh, perspective yeah, yeah, on uh, yeah. this so, uh, on these shifts yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, during the enlightenment uh, at the end of the 1700s beginning of the 1800s uh, we went from a dogmatic religious way of looking at the world, looking at the ourselves and looking at society, and from an essentially agrarian, uh, medieval, feudal way of organizing society into a scientific, rationalistic worldview that was followed by the Industrial Revolution. And this change in worldview and the change in technology that really completely transformed our societies into what we today call modernity, that really blossomed during uh, the last cent century. Uh, but somehow, I think what well, the turbulence we see today 
is an effect of that this way of organizing society and also this worldview, this enlightenment worldview of looking at the world that has given us all these wonderful things like modern medicine and human rights and democracies, th things that we wouldn't want to be without, even though, um, but still, uh, this worldview is sort of reaching it and its end of its capacity to, to help humanity to take the next step. So I think that the shift that we are seeing today is driven by technology, driven by the absolutely terrific speed of technological evolution, but will be a shift in worldview. So we will need to start to uh, um, investigate what a new way of looking at the world could look like. And that way of looking at the world will certainly include all the strengths of the rationalistic and scientific perspective and worldview. As a physicist myself, I know the power of natural science when it comes to understanding and controlling the world. But this rationalistic scientific way of looking at the world needs to be complemented with other perspectives and not the least the internal perspective, this perspective of our mind and consciousness, values, feelings, meaning. Some people talk about that the crisis that we are going through is a meaning crisis and I can agree with that, but also a new way of understanding the depth of society. And especially when society is shifting at these deeper levels, then we need to use tools like deep sociology to understand what, what is really going on. So this shift is actually uh, even deeper than the industrial revolution, if I understand correctly. Yes, yes. So you could say that the industrial revolution that happened still within the uh, scientific rationalistic worldview. Uh, and now we are at a level where uh, I strongly believe that this is not just a technological shift. It's not just the fourth industrial revolution or whatever name you want to, to, to give to this. It is that, but it is also a shift in, um, in our worldview. It has to be a shift in our worldview because the, the fourth industrial revolution just combined with the same um, enlightenment worldview uh, is not uh, getting us to where we want to be. And that is what we are seeing around us right now. It seems that what is, uh, what is going to be requiring from us, uh, it looks like our conventional tools are not enough. Uh, we don't, no. we don't actually, as you said in one of your previous interviews, we don't need more information. We need more ability to navigate. Can you yeah. elaborate a bit on this? No, and, and, and that is one of uh, my conclusions from being in business, uh, in investment banking business for, for again, more than 20 years. And, and that is that in this increasingly complex world, not the least in the business world, um, we need to develop our uh, cognitive capacity and our emotional capacity, I should, should say. But we need to, to increase our, our internal capacity to handle this complexity. And the good news is that science, uh, psychology, development of psychology, uh, leadership uh, psychology clearly shows that it is possible for us uh, humans as managers or as citizens or, or as family persons to, to develop these capacities. That is the good news. The bad news is that it is not easy. And it's not a question of just normal learning. Uh, they, this all has to do with deeper psychological processes, deeper layers of, of our mind. And some people talk about the, the need of transformative learning, immersive learning during long time to be able to develop these things. And these things, that could be things just like being able to see the world in more nuance, not see the world in black and white, us and them, right and wrong, but to be able to see the world in more nuance, to be able to take more perspectives, to use these different perspectives and your deeper seeing 
in making sense of the world in deeper ways. Uh, and it also could be things like uh, expanding and deepening your capacity, your capacity for compassion and empathy. But again, uh, we know that we can expand our empathy, but we also know that we cannot just go on a three-day course and then come back with a diploma and say, now, now I got this with empathy. In your latest book, um, The World We Create, From God to Market, Uh, you say it, it is our ability to create meaning which will decide whether we face a bright future or a tragic decline. Yeah. yeah. Is this so, really so profound? Yes, I, I, I think it is. I think it is. And again, coming from a, a background of, of natural science and, and physics, I, I like the way that uh, some sociologists today, and also psychologists, are starting to see both the society, but also our mind as these complex self-organizing systems. Because if you can see this as systems, and you can see the process you are in, then we know from system science that every now and then, every self-organizing complex system comes to a point that you could call a phase shift or a bifurcation point where you cannot keep the system intact by just incremental increase in its capacity. You come to this point where it's a question of either a breakthrough to a new level of organization, a new level of complexity, or a breakdown. And then you lose complexity and you have fragmentation in the system. And I actually think that, that the human society right now, our world society, is rapidly approaching such a bifurcation point again. And, and going back in history, and I was just referring earlier to uh, the need to uh, under, try to understand the world from perspectives of deep, psych, deep sociology and deep psychology, I also think deep history Is, is very important. History, where we look at the history of humanity over thousands uh, of years, tens of thousands of years. Uh, and if you do that, then you can see that almost every civilization or every civilization in, in the history of humanity has come to one of these points where it is a question of either reinventing yourself as a civilization or facing a break down. And unfortunately, most civilizations at that point have broken down. Uh, but in history, even when we had these breakdowns of the largest civilization, like the breakdown of the Roman Empire, still that was not a, a, a breakdown of the complete world system. That gave the opportunity for other civilizations to flourish. And we had a bit of a sort of a trial and error process throughout human history. But right now, we, we only essentially have one global system and one civilization. And the power of this civilization and the forces that we control today uh, are of global scale, not, not the least uh, environmental crisis that we are facing, but, but also the possibility of, of devastating warfare. Everything so, is at stake, right? Everything, everything is at stake. Everything yeah. is today interdependent and mm -hmm. everything is at stake. And we can see that from the pan pandemic that we have at the moment, that everything is, is interconnected. Mm -hmm. So when we're now reaching this point where it's for us as humanity, either to step up or break down, we, we, we really cannot afford a breakdown because mm -hmm. a breakdown will be a global breakdown. Yeah. Before we dive into a conceptual and, and practical uh, solutions for our future, Uh, I would like uh, you to guide us through the very successful and mass scale social program which you and uh, Lene Anderson uh, described in your fantastic book, The Nordic Secret. Um, the Scandinavian countries uh, have already uh, proven how profound and, transfer and, and uh, how profound transformation of society can be done peacefully and democratically from the bottom up. 
Can you yeah. uh, guide us through ab 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 this? Absolutely. And what makes this relevant today um, is, is, of course, that, as I mentioned, mo most societies and, and civilizations, when facing these uh, technology-driven demands for transformation and reinvention, they break down. But we have a very strong case for a successful uh, transformation. Uh, and that was the way that uh, all the Nordic countries, 100 or 150 years ago, went from being the, the, the poorest non-democratic agrarian societies uh, in, in Europe. We were really dirt poor. Uh, at the end of the, of the 1800s, 30% of the working population in Sweden, for example, emigrated mainly to the US because uh, of hardship. But then just a few generations later, even before the Second World War, we had managed this transition into becoming the richest, the happiest, the most stable industrial democracies uh, in the world. And uh, both Lena and I are very, um, uh, we point out very clearly in, in our book that we are now a bit in, in the Nordic countries losing this. But the fact that we 100 years ago managed this transition so well, that, that is something that is quite extraordinary. And the interesting thing is to understand, try to understand why we manage this transition so well and to see if there is anything that we can learn from that societal transition into the situation that we are today when we are facing an equally, if not greater, transitional challenge. And the interesting thing is that back then we had very... Um, visionary uh, intellectuals and politicians in all the Nordic countries who knew that in times of rapid technological and societal change, and they could see industrialization and urbanization and all of that coming, uh, in those rapidly changing times, it is just so easy for us humans to want to have some sort of external authority to hold on to. We might be looking for a dogmatic religion or an authoritarian leader. But these politicians, they did not want to be authoritarian leaders. They were firmly committed to building sta stable democracies. And as you mentioned, they knew that you can only build stable democracies if you build them from bottom up. So what they wanted to do was that they wanted to to help a lot of people in, in the Nordic countries to take the next step on their personal inner developmental journey and become grounded enough in themselves not to need an external authority to hold on, on to, to hold on to, but rather connect with their internal compass and by that be able to fairly independently navigate this chaotic situation that we had in all of the world, or, or at least all the Western world, around the time before or during the First World War, when these strong forces were acting everywhere in, in the world. Uh, and the way that they went about to do this, to help a lot of people to develop the inner capacities to hold this complexity, and not only hold it, but become active co-creators of the new society, that was quite extraordinary because they knew that this outer transformation has to be connected to an inner transformation. So they created retreat centers, small retreat centers, but many of them. And by the turn of the last century, year 1900, there were a hundred centers like this just in Denmark, 75 in Norway and 150 in Sweden where young adults in their 20s, later on with full state subsidy, could spend up to six months with the expressed aim of uh, becoming grounded enough in yourself and connected with your inner compass to be able to handle this complex situation. 
And I think that that was a wonderful insight. And I think that is very relevant for where we are today. Perhaps we cannot go about creating thousands of retreat centers all over the world, but today we have technology. So perhaps we can use technology to help more people uh, become able to uh, um, handle this situation and to actually independently make meaning of the situation and connect the dots and have the emotional capacity to uh, uh, not freak out, <laughs> but rather think constructively and contribute to whatever new society that wants to be born right now. And th but this program must have been on a massive scale, right? This must have been yes. like tens of thousands of people. Yes, yes, it was a massive scale. And you know, today we are talking about tipping points. So when this program was at its height, almost exactly a uh, hundred years ago, then actually 10% of each new generation had the opportunity to participate in one of these six months programs. And of course, th that created what we today would call a critical mass in society and, and a tipping point and, and made the system be able to organize on a new, more complex, but perhaps also more elegant way rather than breaking down. And I think that, that that are actually the numbers that we need to see today. We do not necessarily need to bring everyone or, or, or a, even a majority up to a level where you can actively contribute to, to the new society that wants to be born. But I, I would say that you, you cannot either really rely on a small elite to do this. You need a substantial part of the population if, if we should be able to to see this through uh, in a positive way. And this was not merely learning, right? Uh, this was like broad and deep embodied experience focused mm. program, right? Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that is why I call, call them a bit jokingly retreat centers be, because uh, um, oh, of course this was also about learning. But uh, if you talk about learning in a broad sense, you can make a distinction between what uh, some thinkers called horizontal learning, which is learning new skills, new information, new, no, new knowledge, and vertical development or vertical learning, which involves your minds and your emotions capacities to handle more complex and more nuanced situations. And these programs were, of course, working in both these dimensions. So it, it was very much a question of also learning to uh, see the new technologies that were coming, not being afraid of new technology, knowing that all new technology can be used for good and bad things and embrace the technological change. Um, also learn how to organize civil society and things like that. Uh, but, but the truly revolutionary, at least seen from our perspective, was the um, uh, realization that this vertical component, which you could even call consciousness development, that that, that was an important ingredient. And that we have forgotten completely about today. Today, we, we concentrate 100% on the, on the horizontal learning. For a very long time, we thought that we could do almost all of our horizontal learning during our school years, and then we were sort of done with the learning. Now we realize that we need lifelong horizontal learning, but we are still forget forgetting about the vertical aspect. And it is the vertical aspect that will help us to make sense of everything that we learn on the horizontal. What, so when we what, take in more information... Of... About... Yeah? Uh, what kind of activities were were uh, were in place for th this vertical learning? Mm, yeah, so th then you can go back again to what we touched on earlier. What what would this vertical learning include? Well, it includes this sort of deeper transformational skills. Uh, it's a matter of, for example, learning how to, in a complex situation, in a rapidly changing situation not shut down, 
our instinct when we become afraid and when things become complex is to shut down. We look for simple solutions to complex problems, but to, to learn how to stay open. So that is one sort of transformational skill. Another one could be, again, as we said before, to be able to see the world in more nuance and, and depth, to take more perspectives on the world, and to uh, increase your emotional capacity, not the least um, empathy that, that we mentioned. And how do you do this? Well, you, you, you can't go on, on just a, a three-day course. And then all of a sudden you are able to take a lot of more perspectives of, of the world and integrate them in a, in a more nuanced and complex way. No, but if you are in the right environment for a long time, and I'm a, I'm a great believer in, in the power of nature when it comes to these uh, transformative uh, learning. And that is why my foundation, we have our own retreat center out in the Stockholm archipelago. Uh, but I'm also aware of the fact that retreats in nature uh, is an expensive um, way of doing that. And that is why my foundation, together with the Norsian Foundation in Stockholm, has taken the initiative to develop a digital platform, a non-profit, uh, open source, co-created dig digital platform called 29K uh, that, free of charge, help people to uh, develop these uh, Trans transformative skills um, but it takes time and you need to be in a group and if you are asking for how do you do it then the simple answer is that you need to create a trusting environment uh, so you feel safe but then you need to allow yourself to be challenged you need to have your your perspectives and your feelings challenged and you need to meet new perspectives and new ways of looking on yourself, looking on the world and uh, looking at society and, and try to reach the blind spots that we all have in our, in our view of ourselves and, and of the world. And that is where deep psychology comes in because all of this involves learning on a very deep psychological level that is almost unconscious. So it's unconscious uh, learning that you need to, uh, to, to reach. So in, instead of singing and walking the nature and discussions, uh, you know, face-to-face -face interactions, how would such a retreat effectively become one in the world of 21st century and the, the online technology that, that you yeah. are exploring yeah. how to integrate? So, of course, we, we have... Uh, we the perceive, uh, uh, from... uh, excuse me, uh, we perceive um, uh, the online communication like a, like a, like a more shallow uh, yeah. way of communicating. So how to bridge, how to bridge that? Yeah. So uh, in our initiative 29K, we, we are, of course, looking at uh, what happened at these centers in uh, uh, Scandinavia that were called folk high schools but we also have the very rich tradition of uh, retreat centers from all over the world that has during the 19th century sorry the 20th century uh, been uh, developing contemporary techniques for for doing this and one can mention uh, centers like uh, the Esalen Institute in 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 California uh, for, for example, where a lot of these psychological techniques have been developed during the second half of, of the 20th century. And the challenging question when we started with the 29K project was, was of course, is it possible to replicate anything of this, what we have learned in real life in a digital environment? And to our surprise, we, we saw that these sharing circles that have always been so important for these transformative learning, these trusted circles where you can feel, feel trusted and free to experiment, but where you are also challenged in your beliefs and, and your blind spots. Could that be replicated digitally? And we found that yes, having these small video sharing groups 
uh, can actually replicate these trusting environments very, very well. And I think we have all now during the pandemic been surprised of how well uh, virtual video conference meetings like the Zoom conversation we have today, how close that actually comes to uh, a meeting in, in, in real life. So, uh, so far we have very promising evaluations of these digital circles. But as you started to point out, these transformation and the transformation of learning, that really happens in a group situation. And you really need the human contact for that to happen. But uh, it looks like it can be digitally transmitted. And how, how did the system manage to avoid bad actors who would lead people astray or indoctrinate? Well, um, I think that was very much, if you're going to, if we're now going back to the folk high schools in, in Scandinavia, these centers in Scandinavia a hundred years ago, how, 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 how was this working? I think this was working qu quite a lot from a, um, a self-organizing and self-adjusting perspective. Um, but of course, um, once, uh, you had state funding for these centers, then of course you had a little bit of control in that way. But the, uh, those who invented this system, they were very keen on also the running and the way that these centers were organized should also be a bottom-up approach. So there were central financing but very decentralized organization of these centers. And they were organized by different organizations. So uh, in some parts of, of, of the Nord Nordic countries, the workers unions played an important role. The um, uh, religious organizations played an important role. Sports organizations, temperance movement uh, played a role and the programs were different and certainly contained a bit of different political angles. I mean, whether they were organized by a, by a workers unions organization or by a religious organization, but the idea of the free thinking and being allowed to challenge all ideas and really connecting not to an outside source of authority, but reaching towards your own inner authority. That was shared by all organizers. And that was part of the requisite, the, the very few requisites, but a few requisites for uh, being able to tap into these governmental funding programs. The solutions for our future uh, right now and uh, in this century, um, how, how to get there conceptually uh, in your view and how to get there practically. Um, and uh, perhaps first a, a, a few words about, about the, the term Bildung, um, where, where this uh, concept actually comes from. Can yeah. this so, be so, yeah. reintroduced on, on a massive scale? Yeah, we, we, yeah. And, and of course, this was on a massive scale mm -hmm. in Scandinavia. The, yeah. the, this was 10% of, of each young generation spending six months in, in these programs. This was an, on a massive scale. And you mentioned the, the German word Bildung. So you could ask the, the question, so where did these ideas come from? Where did these, uh, these progressive or, or insightful intellectuals and politicians get these ideas? ideas from, and they got them from the German idealist philosophers that were writing at the end of the 1700s or at the beginning of the 1800s. And the insight of these German idealist philosophers were that, um, and they all reacted against the enlightenment philosophers view of our mind as a rational machine that was sort of fully developed when we were 
20 years of age or something. You know, they said our mind is not a rational machine. Our mind is a complex organic system that is under lifelong development. And this lifelong organic development, they gave the German name Bildung, which means formation or realization of your mind. And they also pointed out that this process of realization, formation of your, your mind's potential, that can either be supported or hindered. And if you actively support that process, they called that support also Bildung. And this concept, German concept of Bildung, we took to Scandinavia and we made Volksbildung out of that, meaning Bildung for the general, for the general public, not just for the few elites. And that was actually how it was used in Germany and why Germany went, did not go the same uh, way as the Nordic countries. They were very aware of the power of Bildung, but in Germany, uh, the Bildung was only given to, to a very small uh, elite and, and not to the general population. And that led to the fact that once democracy was introduced in Germany after the First World War, it was a very weak democracy, the Weimar Republic that very easily succumbed to this authoritarian uh, uh, leader, Adolf Hitler, just a few years later. The Republic was after the Second World War and already 10 years later, uh, everyone was crying out for a strong leader and, and uh, Hitler won uh, the, the political power. And you can really see the same going on uh, now. It's not making perhaps the strong uh, comparisons to Hitler, but but at least that people in many countries are crying out for, for strong political uh, leaders in a way that we did not see 20 years ago. And I would say that that is because we now can feel how we are starting to get into these turbulent uh, times where we cannot really trust our simple sense-making any longer of what we believed was right and wrong and we can't trust our institutions, we can't trust media in the same way. And then it is very easy to want to find the truth. And if you have a political leader who is claiming uh, the truth, it's very easy to, to succumb to, uh, to that. It's very comforting. It gives you security. And if you haven't got that internal security, if you haven't connected to your inner authority, then uh, um, yeah, it's an easy way to go. Being an experienced businessman, I'm sure you have thought about it also in a, in a practical way, how we can introduce this. Yeah, so, so I think that the first thing we, we, we need to do, and that, that is really my mission right, right now, is, is to realize the need and, and to see this dimension, Be because so far, and again, with the enlightenment philosophers view of our mind just as a rational machine, this thing about cons consciousness development or, or supporting the development of our mind during our full lifetime doesn't really make sense. So the first thing we need to do is really to change our worldview a little bit and, and to again start to realize just like we have done in business for many, many years. I mean, that, that's how I started to, to uh, uh, look into this concept. The fact that we in business have been very aware of the fact that we can actually support top manage, managers' developmental journey to be able to become better managers, to be able to handle complex situations and and the emotions in a better way. So the strange thing is that we in business, we know that this is an important dimension. Whereas in society, we have so far not at all been speaking about this for the last 50 years. It was a top priority in the Nordic countries 100 years ago. But the last 50 years, especially the last 30 years, we, we, this has been off the radar screen. So to, to, so to move in this direction, the first thing we need to do is to have a mind shift, to start to see the importance of this. 
And once we do that, th then we can hope that uh, both our existing tr institutions, like the schools and universities, and the lifelong horizontal learning that institutions that we are starting to build up, that they start to realize that we also need to focus on this vertical dimension. If we should be able to function as good business leaders, even just employees in a complex industry, we need to have these abilities. But we also need to have these abilities as citizens to be able to uh, get our democracies to function well also in the 21st century. So on, on one hand, we will uh, need uh, like self-development, self-authoring ability, right? To develop yeah. the inner compass. But at the same time, we will need not every day, but deep psychology uh, yeah. to the level, for example, Jordan Peterson, Peterson is dragging uh, to the mainstream deep history. Yeah, he, he's, as talk, he's, it. he's talking about, he's talking about Jung, for yeah. example, to, yeah. re to realize that these inner personal inner transformations and you were mentioning that you were using the language there when you were talking about the self-authoring of, of professor robert keegan who, who is one perhaps the most noted developmental psychologist right now at and he's at harvard university he's talking about the inner transformation from the socialized mind where we are dependent on external authority both for our worth but also for our values and directions, and to develop this inner capacity of self-authorship when we are connecting to our own uh, inner, uh, author inner author authority. So when we do that, that sort of transition, that is a transition that takes place on a deep psychological level. So that is why we need to understand the deep psychology of, for example, Jung. And Jung is also pointing to the shadow the fact that we always have these blind spots individually, but also collectively that we need to face. And it's the same thing then in, in sociology that in, in normal times, you can focus on, on the surface and the surface sociology. But when you have these deep societal transitions where you also change, for example, the worldview, or you, you change the root metaphors and the deep narratives are meta narratives then you need to reach deep into sociology and look into what some sociologists call our collective imaginary which are all those things that we all believe in but they do not really exist like money for example money is just a human invention and it works because we all believe in it but if we want, we can change those beliefs. And it's really on that deep level of those deep, collectively held, but socially constructed uh, concepts that the transformation right now is going to uh, take place on. Can, can, so, you walk us, uh, can you walk us through these uh, phenomena of collective imaginary or uh, deep societal myths that seem to be holding our society in a grip and perhaps yeah, and it should. require it some should. extra it attention should. in order to start yeah. understanding them properly. Yeah, it, uh, and they should. I mean, they, they are good things. They, 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 they are the things that make the world function. I mean, it, it's things, just to mention a few things there, you, you can mention the concept of the nation state, it's nothing natural. It's a human invention. You, you, can, you can mention things like... Market. Uh, yeah, the market is a, is a human um, invention. Uh, the institution of marriage is, is a human invention. The family might be a natural thing, but it is the concept of marriage, the concept of property rights, the, the fact that we can own ideas, that, that we can have a copyright or a patent on an idea... Uh, is, is, a so, is a social construct uh, and, and money is a social construct. And, the, and, and all of these things, they make society function. Just like the same ideas in the medieval society that we today think is, is completely strange 
like we believed in in the um, the um, absolute authority and the divine rights of king of kings. We we uh, we believed in uh, God. We we believed in uh, medieval institutions of feudalism. We even believed in in the institution of owning other people, slavery. And these are things that, that even the enlightened philosophers, even the founding fathers of the United States, for example, they didn't question this because these fundamental beliefs that we are talking about, this collective imaginary, it's really like the, is to us like water is to the fish. We are swimming in it. It's even necessary for our survival, but we do not usually reflect upon it. But it is in times of these we need to start thinking about what in our collective imaginary is now outdated. Just like we realize that the divine rights of kings and slavery are outdated concepts today in modernity. What of our cherished concepts that actually make the world function today are things that we need to let go of. And in transitions like this, both personal transitions and transformations and in societal transformations, very much is a question about actually daring to let go of things, let go of beliefs, let go of hidden assumptions that do not any longer serve you as an individual when it comes to your individual transformation. But again, we have the same assumptions, the, the same uh, things that we collectively need to let go of. And just to make this a little bit more tangible again, I, I can say one more thing here, and that is to make the contrast between these socially constructed phenomena that we have in the collective imaginary and the natural world. So I want to take the example of, of oxygen, air, and money. So for me, as, as a citizen in, in the modern world, I could say that I'm almost equally dependent for my survival in the modern world of having access to air and oxygen and money. Okay? And as an individual, I, can, I only have to accept the fact that I need oxygen, but I also can just accept, have to accept the fact that I need money. When I come to my supermarket and I'm checking out, the fact that I know that money is just a human invention, it's a human fantasy, that will not help me to get through the cashier. Uh, if, if I claim that money is just a fantasy and I don't need to pay, I will go to jail. So all our institutions are also supporting our collective imaginary. That's on an individual level. But if you look at a collective level, things are different. Because even if all of humanity came together and said, we do not want to be dependent on oxygen any longer, we couldn't do anything about that. But if all humanity came together, or even just a nation state came together and said, we don't want to believe in money any longer, we want to find another way to allocate goods and services to, tomorrow, then money would be gone. But the, interesting thing, but the interesting thing is that we somehow sometimes seems to, to conflate this and believe that, for example, the planetary boundaries is something that could be up for negotiations, whereas the market forces we have to obey, when it's, of course, completely the opposite. We have, we, have to, we, we, we have to obey the planetary boundaries, whereas the market forces is something that is under our collective control. So understanding these deeper layers of society that we usually take for granted will become very, very important in this transition that we are now in the beginning of. So social imaginary is actually the thing that makes, for example, fiat money function right yes yes yeah. 
And yes. actually, it is, it is the same, as I understand it, it, it is the same thing with Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's the adoption uh, of, uh, of a new instrument in, yeah. in, in it, the context of, of, of the weaknesses of the present fiat money system, right? Yeah, yeah. It, the, the fact that Bitcoin is, is uh, valuable and that, that it is rising in value, at least so far, uh, is, because, is only because we all collectively believe in it. And that, that's, again, a strength and, and a weakness. Because it is the belief in these systems that makes society function, but we also know that we can all of a sudden lose belief in a system. And if we lose belief in Bitcoin, then Bitcoin might just disappear. And if we lose belief in democracy, democracy could just disappear. So if, if and as we are dependent on, on these collective imaginaries for our societies to function, it is very important that we care for them and that we believe in them. But also that when some parts of this are not useful any longer, we also need to know when to let go and how to let go and to do that in an organized way and not in a chaotic breakdown way. And, and that is the discussion I think that we need to, to start right now. How, how can we manage this transition rather than as it has mostly happened before in history through a revolution or through war or through a breakdown and suffering? Will it be possible for us to reduce, reduce the suffering by this time being self-aware as a society of the need of these shift, deep shifts in society and deep shifts in our in us as individuals. That is the key. What has uh, COVID done to our collective imaginary? Hmm? Uh, I think it, it has made us uh, wake up uh, to uh, to the collective imaginary. It has also made us wake up to a lot of facts, like the fact that we are. Uh, interdependent, that, that we are much more connected than we think, and that the... Uh, but this awaken, strong, is this awakening in a, in a conscious way, or is just a, it's just a feeling that something is wrong, but we don't know how to explain it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think it's at least three steps in an awakening, and you're describing the first step. And that is that we we starting to see the cracks in our reality. We starting to see cracks, and and the way that the way I had perceived the world or society or even myself is not the full picture. It's like the glitch in the Matrix in the Matrix movie. You don't know what's going on, but you can see that there is something, and and you can and you feel that. And, and as you point out, very often it just starts with a feeling. You don't know what it is, but you, you, feel you feel uncomfortable. That's the first step. The next step is to be consciously aware of, of what is going on or uh, what you are feeling and to start to intellectually understand this. But that is not enough. Then for the shift really to happen, both in society and in you as an individual, then you need to get it into the body again. Then it needs to be embodied. Then you need to feel also what is going on and get an embodied understanding of, of what's going on. And, and that is so important when we're talking about sense making today, that the sense making uh, is not just a cognitive sense making. For us really to act out of our new conviction, it has to be embodied. It has to be embodied deeply into our values and in our internal compass, almost down at a cell level. How to make a distinction between what is a proper manifestation of collective imaginary and what, what, what patterns are just products of yeah. conspiracy hypothesizing? Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the, 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 that is going on uh, uh, all, all the time. Our collective imaginary 
in, includes uh, very stable uh, ideas like, as we mentioned, money or nation state. We, we almost all believe in money and, and nation states and we have institutions that are backing them up as we mentioned if if i don't respect that i need to pay i, I will go to jail uh, so some of parts of the collective imaginary is um, is embraced by almost any everyone but then of course we have aspects of the of the collective imaginary that uh, we do not all share but that can be stronger or, or or less strong and that could be anything from political convictions to to um, uh, conspiracy th theories that can turn out to be conspiracy theories that are conspiracy theories because they are not supported by our institutions and sometimes it turns out that that was wrong that the institutions did not support them because the conspiracy theory turned out to be true, true. but in but in most cases uh, conspiracy theory are are, are just uh, a way to satisfy our our simple minds need for simple explanations for for complex uh, problems so you can see you can say that this that some people call the mimetic warfare that is going on in society today is a little bit of a of a struggle of this shift in collective imaginary that is is necessary when we have a very stable collective imaginary then you don't have you don't see as much of this but now when this collective imaginary that we have today is starting to break down more and more people see the cracks that we were talking about and looking for other solutions if the inst trusted institutions are only holding on to the old collective Im imaginary and not accepting that we need to start letting go then one effect of that will be exactly as you point out that that will leave room for a lot of uh, conspiracy theories or not very productive narratives and uh, things in in the collective imaginary how can we so uh, we need to come to the point fairly soon where major institutions realize that we are in this shift and that in in a careful and positive way is supporting this shift by letting go of parts of the old narrative and starting to support those parts of the new narrative that we think could be productive. How can we I must take... just, uh, uh -huh. I, I could want to say one more, more thing here, and it's important to know, and I was referring earlier to these shifts in a self-organizing system. When these shifts become deep, you have a phenomenon that is called emergence, which means that something completely new is materializing. So you see an organization again on a more complex and perhaps more elegant way that will have aspects that are completely new that you could not derive from the old system. And that makes these shifts so difficult to plan or to understand and where you need really need to rely on these systems capacity for self-organization so we can't plan this shift in collective imaginary the shift in society but i do think that we can actually support it and the way we support it is to understand that we need a new narrative new collective imaginary that is not falling back on the old simplistic narratives of the past, but is actually trying to see the world again in more nuance, in more complexity, from more perspectives. And one way of supporting our society's capacity for this shift is to support our individual capacity to hold more perspectives, to see the world in more complex terms and to relate to each other, to ourselves and to society in deeper and more complex way. Is this the three worlds that you have been describing that we need to hold yeah. at the same time? Yeah, yes. Uh, so in, in the world we create, I'm, I'm referring to uh, 
many contemporary philosophers or 20th century philosophers who have pointed out, not the least Karl Popper, uh, who is, of course, the, the, the most strongest de defender of the scientific perspective. Uh, I mean, he, his definition of, of, of science is the definition that we are using, uh, still using today. But he still points out that science and this rationalistic uh, enlightenment perspective works absolutely best in the natural world, which he calls the first world. And that is the world of oxygen and planetary boundaries and gravitational forces and all of that. But then he also points out, together with many of the other people like Ken Wilber, Jürgen Habermas, you can even go back to, to Plato, pointing out that our internal world, that is governed by completely different rules. So that is a world where we need to have a phenomenological perspective. And aspects of our inner world, like fear, hope, um, compassion, these are things that cannot be described in the same language as the natural world. Perhaps meaning and purpose could be one of the most important things. Meaning and purpose does not exist in the natural world. Meaning and purpose exists in our individual world that are super important concepts that we, that we can't forget about. And again, that's why we are talking about this meaning crisis today. The crisis is in here to, to a large extent. But then even more importantly, we have the third world. And the third world, that is the world of the collective imaginary, the socially constructed world, which is a little bit a, a, a different thing from each of them. Because again, what I have in my own world, I can just change. Whereas as we were talking about the concept of money, it is a human invention, but it's not under my individual will to just say, it's a fantasy, I don't want to believe in money. It's a world that we can only control collectively. So that is the third world. And if we understand that most of the things that are going on are things that are happening either in the natural world, our inner world, or in our social world, then we can start to understand the world in a more nuanced way and also understand that we need different tools, different ways of understanding these worlds. It's very easy to measure the natural world, whereas the inner world, it's not that easy to measure. How can we overcome various factors of resistance to change from, for example, this, uh, from self-destructing personal habits to, for example, present incumbent leaders, uh, maybe the pollution of mainstream media narratives? Um, how can we mitigate the damage generating by social media algorithms, which are in essence thriving on conflict? Yeah, yeah. So, so you mentioned conflict. I, I would say that the, the, the most important um, um, blocking factor to, to any change, whether it is inner personal change or societal change, is actually fear. So uh, I, I think that uh, in, in order to have a um, smooth transformation, both in us as individuals and in society, the first thing you need to do is to address fear. And fear is a very powerful uh, human uh, uh, feeling. Um, it, in, in some respects, it's, it's uh, perhaps the most, the, the strongest feeling we have because during our uh, evolution, the evolution of, of animals and of humans, uh, of course, fear had a very, very strong survival uh, value. Those of us who felt fear in various situations, we, we had a much stronger possibility to survive. So from evolution, fear is, we are in the grip of fear and we have actively to work against fear. But as you pointed out, uh, social media with the economic uh, business model uh, of social media today. And again, we don't need to have exactly that 
business model for social media. That's the business model that we have ended up with, that social media are re rewarded um, by us spending more time and sharing and commenting and so on. And th the easiest way to do that is to raise fear and anger uh, within us because then we want to engage and we want to react and we want to do, to do these things. So uh, yes, so social media, we, we could blame for, for many of these uh, things that we see out in the world, but it's also a bit too easy just to put all blame on social media because this, this is a general human phenomena and the same was going on, for example, during the French Revolution. Then you had the printing press and they printed all these small, uh, not even newspapers, but pamphlets that were spreading fear and uh, information. And you, you could blame part of the French Revolution and, and how that went so bloody on the fact that it was so easy to print these pamphlets and spread these messages around in a way that was not possible perhaps uh, 50 years uh, or 100 years uh, earlier. So certainly, um, social media is fueling this, but the but the reason why this is fueling it it is that they are supporting um, the, the the instinctive functioning of us human beings. So if to overcome this, I think what we need to do is that we need to realize that we are not these rational decision makers, these homo economicus that can always make the right decisions in every situation for ourselves, for our family and for our society, that we are not these rational voters even, that always vote in the best interest of, of myself, my family and, and the nation of the world, but that we are these irrational, fearful uh, human beings and that our institutions including our social media or any media needs to not exploit those aspects of us humans, not to hack our feelings and, and the, our brainstem and mm, you exploit that for a maximum of, of profit or for votes as in populist uh, politics, but rather that our societal institutions whether they are, are public institutions or private institutions like social media today, they are private institutions in society. All societal institutions need to recognize the weakness of us humans and support the positive sides of us humans and, and make it more easy for us to uh, be the best versions of ourselves when we interact. Uh, not only in family and private life, but also when we interact on social media or when we interact in uh, a political uh, debate and uh, in a national election. Perhaps if and this, if understand, you were... and this understanding is not is not is not there. So the, again, it is it is because the the Enlightenment philosophers did not have this understanding. The founding fathers of the U.S. that were very much in the spirit of, of enlightenment in the good way, but also on the bad, on the bad side that th they all believe in the rationality of us humans. And also the, the, the liberal market uh, system is also in, in the same that, that we actually believe that we as individuals are, are always capable of taking the right decisions. We are not, I mean, that's scientifically certain. We are not, and we need the institutions including the market, to, to help us become the best version, versions of ourselves instead of uh, try, trying to uh, hack our Stone Age uh, minds for political or economic gain. Beautiful thought. Uh, perhaps um, a few words uh, on your current uh, activities on the Oak Island and your yeah. uh, 29K, pro K project. My foundation in Sweden. What the are you Credit preparing? Foundation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Ek the Credit Foundation, uh, which means the Oak Island uh, Foundation. Uh, we, we have, of course, now during COVID, not been able to uh, 
have almost any any activities uh, in in real life. We have gone very much uh, uh, virtual. We have developed the Air Credit Anywhere, which is a digital platform for our mainly Swedish uh, uh, community. But we hope that, uh, and we are planning that uh, at at next summer and in the autumn we will be able to uh, have. Uh, physical activities and uh, we are right now planning for example youth camps during next summer so uh, we every summer at the Ekferet island we have youth camps for adolescents uh, in the age of uh, 14 15 16 uh, sometimes 17 and 18 year, years old where we try to help young adults to get started on their journey of finding their own inner compass. We are also planning some invitational conferences and other things out on the island. And we are in, in the little bit larger network in Europe, the Emerge network. And for those of you who are interested in, in these ideas and what we are doing in that network, you mm -hmm. can check out our uh, website, which, which is a media platform in this area with the URL whatisemerging.com. Um, and we are right now planning after summer to have a bit of a larger European gathering uh, uh, somewhere of uh, the network that is interested in exploring these things that we have been talking about today. Thomas, uh, thanks so much for your valuable time and this great talk. Thank Hope you. We can Thank do you. this again sometime, sometime in the future. Yeah, I, I'm, lo I'm, I'm looking forward. In the meantime, where can our audience continue to follow you? Well, I, I, I would suggest you could download the free uh, app 29K if you are interested in the inner development and, and inner transformation. Uh, or uh, you can uh, uh, follow, follow what's going on in, in the broader network at whatisemerging.com. That would be my two uh, suggestions. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>